put the questions in the box. If you're dying to speak up, please raise your hand. We'll pluck you out of the crowd and um, yeah. I uh, must admit, I forgot. There was a question from last week that I was supposed to look up and I forgot what it was. I have to be more diligent about my task. So, so whoever remembers what that question was, if it's still burning in your mind, please don't hesitate. And if there are no questions, we'll just go straight to Nile. Janet, I, you, I can't, you're I can't, I <laughs> can't, I can't believe there aren't any questions. Good for I'll me. ask a question. All right. Well, what, do you, what do you know about the timetable on um, Moderna or Johnson and Johnson uh, boosters? You mean talking about the Delta boosters specifically? No, just time whether whether they're going to happen. Well, I mean, they're already happening. But today, apparently, FDA said no boosters for first line workers, including teachers, physicians, nurses, etc. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't get the booster. You, everybody understand it, right? If you're absolutely bur burning and dying to get a booster and you're in not one of those categories, nobody can ask you any questions. You just walk in and you get a booster. You know, if you're asking when they're going to have a Delta included into the, I have no idea. I, I, I have not seen any information anywhere. And from my understanding, there is no clarity on even if they will be able to make them specific enough to boost the efficacy so i don't know i i'm not a haven't seen anything <clears throat> if anybody have any answer to that by all means all right new treatment all right janet i knew they would ask that all right so i think um Donna is asking about this new medication that is on the news all over the place, a daily pill to treat COVID. Let me show you my screen so you understand what Donna is asking about. So it's this thing. You know, the reality is it seems promising in the trials. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. One sec. So you can read it for yourself. It's pretty detailed. Um, they cover um, specifics what this is. It's a, it, basically a different series of, un, or there's more than one product out there, um, like a Tommy flu. They're trying to come up with a peel that will block the replication as a tablet that can be taken at the onset of symptoms. Um, I don't know more than that. I know that I've read one, well, we reviewed one study during the one of the grand rounds recently. It looked good. Um, you know, it looked very promising. Uh, but what I don't know is the, the toxicity wasn't reported because it's not a very long course. And um, what's also not clear is sort of what the cost is going to be, how quickly it's going to get all covered. I mean, I'm assuming it will get covered and all that. But I think there's just so many unknowns we have to keep up with the data. Um, Janet, what'd you put in BBC? Is, is that a different, because I know one um, peel is developing, getting developed by Merck. Um, there's another company that's developing something else. Um, so they're, they're, they're gonna be, I think you pull up the same. Uh, it's uh, this drug called Malnupiravir. Malnupiravir. Well, that's a twice daily at the moment of onset. So, you know, but the data is pretty interesting. I mean, you know, it cuts the efficacy, cuts the length of illness and severity in half, roughly, according to the published data. But, you know, it's exciting. Just don't know more. So, Don, is that helpful? Yeah, I just think it's interesting because but typically we don't have medications to treat viral infections. So well, Tommy, Tommy flu. Tommy flu is a good example. Tommy flu actually works and it's pretty, pretty effective and low cost. Um, the difference, this medication is definitely biologic. The problem with biologics, they tend to be very expensive. So what will happen, um, you know, that's, it's kind of hard to, it's, it's hard to predict, but if at least during the pandemic, I'm assuming that once it, gets approved, it'll be covered because everything for disease is currently covered, so. 
And, yeah. and to answer your question, Misha, yeah, uh, the different links, um, the BBC and the MedPage today, they're both concerning the, the Merck. Right. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, the Merck's, Merck product. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen more than one, but this one seems to be the one that's closest to get approved. So I, you know, but I don't know what the timing is going to look like, whether it's months or weeks. So I guess we'll have to just wait and see. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Everybody should read Cecile's post in there because that's what's happening. If you want your shot, just go get it. If they ask you why it's on your consciousness, whatever you're going to tell them. It sounds like a very Russian approach. To doing it. <laughs> Misha, did you see the um, Susan's question? Oh, looking. Yeah, they, they, they just started providing boosters for, uh, thanks for, good point. Yeah, if you qualified in UGW, your patient come to GW. They, I, I think you have, there's a walk-in time and there's also like, you can also have it, if you're seeing a, anybody there and, and you just want to get it during that time, they can administer to you as part of the visit. But I will look it up exactly what they say. By the way, the flu shots are also here. So if you're also needing a flu shot. But yeah, let's talk about this for a second. Uh, personally, I, I, I had a flu shot last year. I'm, I'm hesitant this year. I feel that chances of flu are going to be low the same way as last year. The reason for that is, look, we're all masking. We're all trying to self-isolate. There was no flu last year. So I think if you're high risk, so 65 plus, get a flu shot, but I don't recommend getting them at the same day with COVID. So separate them by a few weeks. Um, I generally say to everybody, try to get the flu shot at the end of October because it tends to cover you longer. The flu is not going to show up until sometime in November. And so you have time. If you get it very early, the, it doesn't last for more than four or five months. So you're missing the coverage of the spring if you take it too early. That's a general statement. It could be more effective, less effective each year slightly varies, but that's a general comment. And so if you want to get a booster, COVID booster, get it now. And then in a couple of weeks, get the flu. flu okay. Shot. Um, I think we'll wrap up the COVID questions for today and move on to Niall. Thank you, Janet. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Niall McFarlane. Hi, Dr. Kogan. Hi, Monica. Um, so I am an occupational therapist by licensing and trade, and I specialize in something called fascia. Um, I just want to pull up the gallery really quick because I want to ask a question. Raise your hand if you know what fascia is, if you've heard of fascia. Oh my gosh, a lot of you. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, 10 years ago when I first started in this field, no one would have raised their hand. <laughs> so that's exciting. So I specialize in connective tissue and looking at how the body stores trauma and emotion and how that's tied into the physical manifestation of symptoms. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today. So my background if you kind of just like kind of pan out a little bit and look at all of what I do as a practitioner, I am very holistic. Occupational therapy by nature is designed to look at how our occupations are either functional or dysfunctional and how we're not able to fully access our occupation. So when you think about that term occupation, it's everything you occupy your time with. So I am very holistically trained. We are designed to look at the big picture. And then when you think about fascia, it's our connective tissue. It's literally the thing that connects us from head to toe, surrounding every organ, every vessel, every bone, every muscle down to the cellular level. We're made up of fascia. So that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today. And I hope it's okay. I've done this enough times. I feel like Janet almost like implicitly trusts me just to, to stay on track. <laughs> so I kind of felt into this um, talk today and felt in, into the group a little bit. And I had a couple of things come up that felt really relevant that I wanted to talk about. And they are specifically some diagnoses known as PIBO and MTHFR. 
Okay, so I'm going to get to those in a little bit, but I want to kind of, uh, again, pan out and start more holistically. Why am I going to talk about these things? Well, the reason I want to talk about this stuff today is because I want to focus on why don't we heal? Why are we not healing? Everyone here, I'm sure, is bought in on some level to this bigger picture holistic view of health or you wouldn't be here, right? But there are still things that maybe you're missing. So I'm hoping maybe I can validate your experience today and help shed some light on what is missing. So I'm going to talk about five things specifically, and I invite you to write them down because whenever you're asking yourself this question, why don't we heal? I want you to ask which category does it fall in as to why maybe I'm not healing, okay? So I'm seeing a lot more chronic issues today than I was pre-COVID and they're not COVID related. They are because we're kind of at this um, epitome, epitome of the straw that broke the camel's back where people have been kind of accumulating stress for an extended period of time with underlying pre-existing conditions. And then you add in a sedentary lifestyle and now you have the straw that broke the camel's back. So there's typically a few reasons why that happens and why we're kind of spinning our wheels a little bit. The first reason is our system is not designed for a holistic human experience, specifically our medical system. Now I will say um, Dr. Kogan is working diligently to correct that, I think in the medical community, but in general, as I've seen for the past decade plus in wellness, health and wellness, our medical system is not designed to consider all of the human experience, which when you boil it down, it boils down to three areas, mind, body, and spirit. So anytime you are getting medical care, I invite you to look at, is this addressing all three areas in your life, your mind, your body, and your spirit? And if it's a no, you need to find a new practitioner. I'm not kidding. You need to find a new practitioner. Because if you look at the way our healthcare system is designed, it is designed to send you to a general practitioner and then refer out. That's what an HMO does. It keeps you stuck in this kind of medical hamster wheel, so to speak. And you, can, you don't have to do that. You don't. Even with Medicare, Medicaid, HMOs, whatever your plan may be, you can find practitioners who are considering the mind, the body, and the spirit. And if you're struggling with that, um, hopefully I can help address that a little bit later. The second question you wanna be asking um, in terms of you know why aren't you healing? Um, we are cyclical beings who require ebb and flow. So are you getting those needs met in your daily life? Are you looking at the ebb and the flow of the human experience? So here's a few different places that might show up in your life. The first one is, are you looking at how the moon might affect you? And okay, stay with me, stay with me, hold on. <laughs> we are made up of over 60% water. So we are affected by the moon cycles, we just are. Um, and if you add into that, um, if you're somebody who is assigned female at birth and you have a uterus or, or female anatomy, you are a cyclical being, you have a cycle. Okay. So consider those things in your daily life. And are you tracking those things in your daily life? If you're postmenopausal or premenopausal, you can still track and see, do you have a monthly cycle? And what I mean by that is, do you have periods of time where you feel more fatigued, periods of time where you feel more irritable, periods of time where you feel more manic, periods of time where you have increased energy, periods of time where you have increased pain. So I invite you to start charting that over the course of a day, a week, a month, and a year. And after a year, look and see if you have certain patterns because we all do and practitioners don't talk about this. We all have cycles of contraction which typically last um, a month or so, and then cycles of expansion, which also typically last a month or so. And if we're not tracking those things, they often get misdiagnosed 
as manic depression or depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, which are all things that do kind of ride that roller coaster. Okay. So if you can chart, um, you know, over a day, a week, a month, and a year, that's really going to help you start to increase awareness around what your natural cycles are so that you can start to build your, increase your understanding of when you can do certain things and when maybe you need to pull back. The next thing that I want you to look at is um, in terms of why aren't, why don't we heal is it's because we are attempting to heal in isolation. Now, for some of you, all of these things are gonna be true. And for some of you, only one or two are gonna be true, but I want you to write them all down. So we are attempting to heal in isolation. And I think that's especially true in our westernized culture. Um, I think that's especially true for white bodied individuals. We are told that we are supposed to carry the weight of our community individually. And we don't really get an opportunity to see how we are very connected and every and our experience is not unique. So some of the things you can do is kind of look at what are your wellness communities. Um, this container right here is a wellness community. And aside from this, do you have other wellness communities? And if you don't, why not? And if you do, why are you choosing those? So I want you to start asking these questions. And that kind of brings me back to the first thing I said about um, practitioners. If you have a, a practitioner who's not meeting your mind, body, spirit needs, and you're in a pre-existing wellness community, that becomes a built-in resource for you to be able to access practitioners who will meet your needs. So that one right there, um, we are attempting to heal in isolation. That's a big barrier to healing. And if you don't have a wellness community, I highly, highly recommend starting to ask around. The other thing about um, this idea of attempting to heal in isolation is then we don't really see how our mental health is not unique. And, and I don't mean that to invalidate anybody's experience. I simply mean it the same as when I say we are cyclical beings, we also are not having a unique mental health situ um, situation or experience. And when we're able to see that it's not unique, then we're able to, um, we're able to kind of trace it back and make it feel less big. So I have the question, what does a wellness community look like? So there is the sick industry and then there's the wellness industry, right? The sick industry is dealing with people who already are symptomatic. The wellness industry are dealing, they're, they're talking about things that are increasing your quality of life. And they typically have to do with the mind, the body and the spirit. Um, this can get a little tricky because sometimes it can uh, really focus on spirit, the spirituality piece. And I, I invite you to really be conscientious about that because I've been in the wellness industry for over a decade and some wellness industries kind of border, um, uh, how do I say this politely, um, cults. <laughs> So be conscientious about your, uh, your choices around spiritual communities, but yoga, meditation, wellness circles, like women's circles, oftentimes drum circles, those are all kind of wellness communities. If you have um, an interest, then you can, you can look up and see if there is um, something in the area. For example, um, I have a friend who's a homeopath and she'll do open event, homeopathic events um, where you can come and kind of learn about homeopathy. So if you have an interest, I invite you to kind of start to just start from that as a starting point. But if you are not sure, you can absolutely reach out to me. Um, you can find my, you can contact me through my website, which is bluenilletherapy.com. And it's spelled N-Y-L-E like my name. And you can just say, hey, I was on this talk. I'm, I'm interested in this thing. Do you know of any wellness communities that are related to that? And I can start to point you in that direction. But what I find is it's people who are already in wellness communities who typically find me. 
All right, and it's because they're asking questions and they're not just defaulting to what's already available. And that's kind of why I wanna talk about this because I'm gonna give you permission to do that. Bringing me to my next um, question around why, or really like challenge around why we don't heal. Oftentimes it's because we have an underlying condition. And that's where I wanna talk about SIBO and MTHFR. Everything I'm talking about today is just to bring awareness to areas that maybe you aren't already aware of and maybe you are. Um, I'm also curious how many of you have heard of SIBO. It's S-I-B-O or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Raise your hand if so, just want to look. Okay, cool. So um, I won't get too, too into it because it's, it's not my scope of practice but small intestinal bacteria overgrowth basically just means that you have more bacteria in the small intestines where you're supposed to have it in the large intestines. And the reason that's bad is because then some of the foods that we actually think are really good for us, like kombucha, fermented foods, um, all, there's so many uh, like protein shakes and things that have probiotics added to it. Shoot, there's even cereals now that you'll see like probiotics have been added to cereals. Well, that's fine if you don't have SIBO. If you have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestines and you're taking probiotics or taking fermented foods, it's actually making you sicker it's feeding that bacteria in your small intestine. And people who have SIBO typically stay very stuck in this um, pain cycle because we are starting to learn how correlated gut health is to healing, right? Gut health is correlated to um, mental health. It's correlated to our ability to, um, to think cognitively. We're even starting to find studies where it's linked to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So the gut is considered the second brain. And if you have SIBO, but you're doing everything else right, that's going to keep you stuck in this um, negative healing cycle. Same with this other diagnosis. Um, uh, so I have a question, shouldn't we have a test before taking probiotics? Yes, I think so. That's a really good point. Truly, truly, not all, pro all probiotics are created equally. And the probiotic that um, it depends on what you have going on, but SIBO doesn't respond well to like one of the bacillus strands. So that's in most probiotics. And if you're taking that, you're feeding that bacteria in the wrong place of your gut. So yes, you shouldn't just default to taking a probiotic until you've had a test first to rule out SIBO. And there are several different types of SIBO. So you want to work with your practitioner. And I'm telling you this now so you can go back to your doctor who may not be telling you this and say, hey, can you test me for SIBO, please? <laughs> the second one that you should have on your radar is called MTHFR. No, sadly, I don't know exactly what this stands for, but it's methylation something. Um, so it's a methylation. Methyl, methyl tetrahydrofolate. Thank you. Can you say that uh, one more time? Methyl tetrahydrofolate. That's a methylated form of the folate that is a most biologically active form of the folate in our body. Thank I'll you. Yeah. No, no, no. I was actually hoping you would chime in. <laughs> um, so I refer to it as MTHFR or the mother effer gene mutation. Um, why I care about this is because I work on connective tissue. And one of the things I constantly run into is a midline restriction. Now, people, especially mothers who carry the MTHFR gene mutation, as Dr. Kogan said, it has to do with folate. You can't methylate folic acid, synthetic folic acid properly, you can't even really methylate the, the organic form of folate in the way that you should be able to. What we know is folate is what creates the nuchal tube or the spine of the baby when they're first created. That's the midline of the body. And then the arm buds and the leg buds and the head, it all expands off of that. 
So if the mother is not methylating folate properly or the synthetic form of folic acid, then the babies are being born with midline birth defects. The most common midline birth defect being tongue tie. One of the more severe ones being spinal bifida. But you don't have to have spinal bifida and you can have these more mild and subtle uh, midline birth defects and it dramatically affects your ability to heal. So um, there's not a lot you can do if you have MTHFR already, but it's more an awareness factor, being aware that it exists. There are tests that you can take to see if you have it. If you are finding that you just feel bad all the time, it could be that you have MTHFR. It could also be you have SIBO, but it's very likely MTHFR. In fact, there's a higher prevalence of it today than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago because we're genetically passing it down to our babies. Which brings me to my last challenge in terms of why don't we heal? Um, MTHFR mutation seems to be very common amongst people with connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos. Absolutely, yes. For many people, it's also histamine related. Thank you. So it's so good to know so many of you have this on your radar already. There are things you can do about it. There are nutrigenomic supplementations that you can take that will reactivate that MTHFR gene. Um, and honestly, there, there are some nutritional things you can take aside from like activators, but there are like different ways to kind of biohack the genome to reset that MTHFR gene, which kind of brings me to my last, um, my last inquisition or challenge in terms of why don't we heal? Because we have unhealed generational trauma. So it's not just the genetics that are passed down, it's also the epigenetics. And what we're starting to learn, especially in areas of functional medicine, is our thoughts create our realities. Our thoughts, our cells are receptors. They're constantly taking in information and they're responding to what's showing up in your environment. So whatever, um, whatever environmental trigger happened in your lineage, you can, it will turn on and off certain gene expressions and you'll carry it down generation after generation. Now this one gets a lot more existential and I talk a lot more about this in some of the courses that I teach. Um, I just got done teaching a pain relief clinic that some of you were at, by the way, hi. And I talked a lot about karma and generational trauma. If this is something you're more interested in learning, again, go to bluenilotherapy.com, reach out to me and just say, hey, I was on this thing. I'm really interested in learning more. Can we have a conversation? And I would be happy to do a consult with you. But at the end of the day, these are all the things that I address as a practitioner, at least as a starting point. I am not the specialist in any one of these areas, but I am kind of the first line um, for a lot of people who have been through the traditional medical system and they're finding they're really ready to start thinking outside of the box. So I wanted to talk about these things today because I find I talk about them with all my patients at some point. So if I could like really hone in on why we don't heal and share it with you today, hopefully I started getting the wheels turning for some of you. So I'm open to questions if you have any or further conversations about any one of those. And, I, and if anyone needs me to repeat them, I'm happy to do that as well. And my cue to you all is to please write them down. And, and whenever you start asking yourself, why is this still an issue for me? Go back to this list and see if it hits on one of those. Oh, hi, Luann. Thank you. Yeah, I'm teaching something called the Embodiment Project. It actually starts tomorrow. So there's some people on here who are participating, and that's all about accessing the fascia and um, um, breaking out of generational trauma cycles. Oh, there's a few of you on here. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited for it. 
Oh, thank you. So if there are no other hey, questions. I have a question real quick. It's Sage, by the way. Hi. <laughs> hey, so for your fascia work, for the Maya fascia work that you're practicing, especially for this generational trauma or the, for the Cebu, is it predominantly abdominal visceral work that you're doing or does it just kind of a depend on each situation? That's a good question. Yeah, I know you do some some body work as well, don't you? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I am trained in visceral manipulation. Um, so visceral manipulation is viscera is another word for the fascia that covers the organs. So it's organ specific, and I'm trained to release the the fascia around the organs. So yes, my people with SIBO especially were. Um, I'm starting to realize, and I actually hope to do a, a podcast about this at some point, um, I'm starting to see a correlation between people who have slow motility. So motility is another word for the kind of the, the organs movement. So I'm starting to notice a correlation between slow motility of the digestive system and an increased um, incidence of small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So I think those two are correlated because if you can't move the food through, of course it has a higher opportunity to attract bacteria, right? So visceral manipulation is a really great treatment for people who, are, who have a diagnosis of SIBO. However, you also have to do the herbal, there are herbal regimens and things that you often have to do along with the visceral manipulation. But if you're doing one and not the other, that's that holistic approach, right? You're, you're only addressing the mind. I'm sorry, you're only addressing the body and you're not addressing the whole picture of the body. Yeah, awesome. so Thank visceral you. manipulation is the way to go for sure. You're welcome. Okay. Hey, Thank you so much funny. for that. That was very informative. Seems like a good time to transition to the, the next phase. So Sage, I think you're up next. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and, and thanks again, Niall, for that insight. I do think your, your talk was rather fascinating, if I may say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dad puns all day. Okay, folks, <laughs> with that out of my system, um, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us on this forest bathing uh, walk, if you will. And for today's walk, we're gonna do something a little different. Um, if you've been on one of our, my walks before, um, so this is something that you're, you're familiar with of uh, the different invitations that we'll be doing, but we'll have like a bit of a surprise twist, if you will. So if I ask, or rather, if I could ask you to have a pen and paper close by, We'll be using that soon enough. But to get into our forest bathing, as you can see, there is a pond in front of me. And right now I'm at a pond that is in the Azalea Collection here at the National Arboretum. So I do wanna say thank you to them for sharing this space. And if we just take a moment, we're gonna focus in on this pond here. As you can see, there's some rocks and trees in the background. <clears throat> and if we just take a moment to just kind of be still. And to find a place of comfort as you're stand sitting here or in the space that you are in. Take a moment to breathe, to inhale this air that surrounds us perhaps holding it for a moment and then gently exhaling. And again, gently inhale. And feel the rhythm of your breathing. And as we see the screen before us, or perhaps even what may be in front of you, if you have the viewpoint, of the outdoors. Observe an element that's before you, whether it be the rock, perhaps a stick, or even a leaf. 
And just take a moment to imagine what it may be like to be that being. I wonder what it's like to be observing the warmth of the sun, perhaps feeling the coolness of a breeze. I wonder what it's like to be that being and listen to the orchestra of the woods. And again, nice channel deep breath. I invite you to take a moment, grab that pen and paper, and think of five words that describe what you observed or what you noticed. Just jot them down on a piece of paper. Five simple words. Jotting down what you observed or noticed. I'll give you a moment to jot them down. Now we're going to reduce it down to one word, one word that you would like to share in a chatterfall. And if you're not familiar with the chatterfall, what that will be is you write down, type in one word into the chat box, but do not send it just yet. We'll send collectively once I give the countdown. And from there, all those words will just pop up and I'll just read them as best I can and as fast as I can. So if you have your one word chosen, go ahead and key that in if you have not done so already. And I'll begin the countdown. And as soon as I say send, go ahead and do that. So three, two, one, and send. So relaxed, movement, alive, alive again. Okay, thank you for sharing everybody. So now what we'll do is transition, oh, in peace, there we go, thank you. What we're gonna do is transition now, and we're just going to observe what's in motion for this next invitation. If you bear with me a moment, I'm just gonna slowly make my way here and gather my stuff. And we'll just take a stroll through the azalea garden. We're just going to observe the things in motion. Perhaps if you're indoors, you have a window close by. 
more than welcome to also look outside that window. Or perhaps step outside if you are at home and there's a deck or a patio that you can access. Again, you can grab that pen or pencil, that writing device, and write down another five words of things that you noticed or observed that were in motion. I'll give you a few moments to jot those words down. And as before, we'll choose one word to share in the Chatterfall. And like before, I'll give that countdown before we send collectively. So I'll give you another moment. And if you're ready, let's go ahead and key that word in to the chat. And on three, two, one, let us send. Pathway, gifts, bounce. People.
boats. Boats. Lovely. Thank you for sharing, everybody. So now, as we look before us, we see the lovely view of these meadows, plus the columns and the trees. So this is what I invite you to do now. With those words that you found, that you've created, or rather came up with, I'd like for you to create a poem, a haiku, in fact. You can use the words that you've had, or you can obviously add other words, but let's try to use some of the words that we had come up with. And I invite you to go ahead and do that. So if you have not familiar, if it's been a while since you've ever written a haiku, remember the haiku is three lines. The first line has five syllables. The second line has seven syllables, while the third line has five syllables. So I'll give you a few moments to be creative and inspired by nature on this forest bathing walk and come up with a haiku. And again, you'll hear that chime to let you know when we'll gather together. Welcome back, everybody. It looks like 
Some of you have started with the haikus already. Outstanding. If I may just read that, and it looks like we've got some Yolanda. It says, the sun on my face makes me float into this space, and it is all mine. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. And from Lauren, barking sea lions wait. River water flows smoothly while sailboats glide by. Where are you that you see these sea lions? Luan. Sorry, it was Luan. Luan, where do you see these sea lions? Oh, I wish I was there. <laughs> and then let's see, what else did we have here? Light, breezy shadows reveal windy branches, yet all is at peace. Thank you, Monica. And from Jennifer, whoops. From Jennifer, we have flat rocks, shadow light, winding along twisted path, bounce into open. And from Irene, we have to dance with nature is to care for all that is ours. Ah, Glenn, Lynn, Oregon, nice. Uh, ooh, let me read Irene's again now that I have it all together. To dance with nature is to care for all that is ours, to care for always. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing your haikus. I opted to do today's forest bathing walk a bit differently. Um, something that I've done in the past with a bunch of high school students from our local charter school, Cesar Chavez School here in DC. <clears throat> and I took a bunch of I guess they were ninth, 10th graders uh, through the Arboretum. And it was myself and two of their English teachers. And the students had never been into a green space before. So a lot of them, this was a very new experience. And having that experience through forest bathing with the promise of um, some poetry written by their, through their experience was definitely a very moving a uh, moving moment. Uh, it was very touching to hear these students' words and how they were able to connect. Um, so I just wanted to share that experience with you all and just let you know that each of us has that opportunity to create poetry or art, truly, for any, um, for any kind of art style, really, is to touch into nature and, and know that that too can be a healing factor in our life. And so I would like to sh say thank you again to each of you that have shared. And I think we have another haiku that came up. There we go from Linda. Seeking life giving, peaceful green awakening, alive gentle gifts. Thank you. And I do know that we have um, a couple minutes, so I do want to respect folks' time if they do need to be someplace. But before we head out, if I can, oh, if I may, sorry, trying to get technical here. And I'm, ah, there we go. <laughs> here I am. I see myself on screen. Yay. So, as usual for our forest bathing walks, I would like to end with a tea ceremony. And I'm just going to shimmy this up here so you get a better view of me. Um, I would just like to pour three cups of tea. And I have these cups right here. And the three teas are, this one is for each of you for joining us today. So thank you for being here. I'm grateful that you've joined and was hopefully able to enjoy and get a piece of this nature that's before us. And then this tea is for myself as a guide. And again, thank you all for being here. And then this last one is for our host. I am not the host, I'm just a guide. Our host is this land that we are on. Perhaps it's the green space that is near to your house, to where you live, perhaps to where you work, or even where you recreate. But here, where I am at, is at the Arboretum, the National Arboretum. And so 
I'd like to say thank you to them here at the National Arboretum USDA, the grounds we are on. They are the current stewards of this land. I'd also like to thank the future generations, the future stewards of this land. Hopefully they'll have much more land and beautiful land that they can take care of and pass on. And lastly, I'd like to thank also the original stewards of this land here in Washington, D.C., along the Anacostia River and the this Potomac River, the people of the Piscataway and the Nunchuck. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge their stewardship of this land. So that way we, the future generations, can enjoy it. So thank you all again for joining us. And hopefully that gives us a minute. Thank you, Sage. This You're was welcome. wonderful. There's a lot of comments in the chat. Um, I see them popping up. You're welcome, everybody. I hope you all get to spend a little time in nature this weekend. It's absolutely gorgeous, not just on the screen, but all of us <laughs> being there. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Niall, too. Thank you, Sage. You're welcome. Right. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekend.